Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I understand it takes a moment for, for the um, auditorium, the virtual auditorium to fill up. So I have to stall for a second, but a very good evening to you all. Welcome to a Norfolk Wildlife Trust's Ply Calling events, and a particular welcome this evening to our friend, Roy Dennis. Roy, we've now been doing these for so long. Lockdown has gone on so long. You're now back for a second time. Welcome. We're delighted to have you with us. Well, good evening, and it's nice to be back, I must say, although I still find this a strange way to do these things, but at least I can stay here in Murray and, and talk to you, yeah. And we're all getting used to this strange world where we live more of our lives online virtually. But happily, you've got so much to say and so much experience that it comes across, the essence of Roy Dennis comes across, um, even via the airwaves. A very big welcome to you, a very big welcome to everybody in the audience this evening. This is March's Cly calling event from uh, Norfolk Wildlife Trust. This is, of course, a free event, and we are very grateful to support from North Norfolk District Council for helping us put on these events. But should you be feeling very flush with cash, um, you have the opportunity to purchase Roy's latest book. Last time Roy was with us, we spoke about Cotton Grass Summer, and you can still purchase that from Wild Sounds and Books, who are our partners up here in North Norfolk, who stock the books in our visitor center. But I don't actually have a physical copy. Roy, you have a physical copy. You can wave a copy. There we go. The very beautiful Restoring the Wild, 60 Years of Rewilding Our Skies, woods and waterways which is a great great read it's not yet out so if you do wish to purchase a copy you can put in your order right now with wild sounds and books and david who is producing our ply education and events person is producing the event this evening he will pop a link in your chat attached to this event so please follow that link to buy Roy's latest wonderful book, Restoring the Wild, which of course is what we're talking about this evening. Also, if you're feeling fabulously wealthy, the main theme of this evening is rewilding. And we are in the process of rewilding some land around our Thompson Common Reserve. And David is also going to pop a link in the chat about our Thompson Common appeal, because we are purchasing farmland around the edge of our extraordinary Thompson Common Reserve, and we are restoring it to ancient grassland using traditional breeds of livestock, digging out ponds, ancient pingos that have been lost. And that's a project that's going to take us several years, but we have to begin it by purchasing the land. And we are now within a, a white-tailed eagle's tail feather of securing all of the money. And we're just looking for a final millionaire. So if anyone's feeling very, very wealthy this evening, please, please do watch the film, learn about our Thompson Common project and support us. If you have any questions for Roy, and I'm perfectly certain there will be lots of questions for Roy, you can pop them in the question and answer. Some of them I will channel to him myself, and some of them we will try to bring speakers in and we will notify you of the fact that we're going to do that, you'll receive a message. And just a final thing before we start talking about Roy's wonderful book, Restoring the Wild, our next event, which you can find on our website, clycalling.com, is with the folk singer and naturalist and conservationist, Sam Lee. And he will be with us at the start of April. All the details you can find both on the Norfolk Wildlife Trust website and clycalling.com. Roy, once again, good evening. Thank you very much for being with us. Now, the first thing I want to point out from your book, your book was a great, a great read and clearly, I mean, literally the work of a lifetime, literally the title, the subtitle, 60 years. And, and the first thing that struck me about your book was that it, it is very much, everything that you do is based on a lifetime spent from a boy in Hampshire to your young, adulthood in Fair Isle and then Scotland as a field naturalist. And you make reference a lot to field naturalists. So if I can just quote you, this is particularly from red kites. And when you're collecting red kites in, in Scandinavia, you say, it was very clear to me though, that the success of our visits to collect young kites in Skana were due to Per Olof's outstanding knowledge of the location of the nests. Our tally that day was 45 nest sites and over 150 red kites. I now understood how Per Olof could take us unerringly through the summer green forest to occupied nests. It was down to dedicated field work in all weathers, the true basis of a field ornithologist's year. Now, to me, reading your book, that's really the true basis of Roy Dennis's life. Um, 
it's being a proper naturalist in the first place. Yeah, I've always thought of myself as a field ornithologist. That's, that's what I was as a kid, you know. I, I grew up on the Hampshire coast and I was lucky that, uh, you know, there was such a great gang really of excellent birders or what we call bird watchers on these days. Um, who taught me so much in places like Langston Harbour and uh, Titchfield Haven and in the New Forest. And it was a time when, you know, you were just so determined to learn. And uh, I always remember that this, the Boy Scouts helped me because we had a, a Boy Scout troop, which was very much a wild one, you know, living in the woods and it, our hut was a, up a tree and that. And that the scoutmaster or his mother would, I'd see a new bird and they'd let me borrow the handbook of British birds. And I'd take it home and, uh, and have it for one day. And I remember, I think it was a common gull. I'd never seen a common gull before. So I must've been about 13. And I read up about common gull. And the next day you could have asked me any question about common gulls and I would have known the answer. And so that is what a field ornithologist is. And, I, you know, I've been out today. On Monday, we were out building osprey nests. And then we had spare time. So we built an extra golden eagle nest. So we had a long day in the field. But I've got two brilliant climber fens. And I just think that being in the field is really the most important thing. Both because it's good for you, but also because it gives you the the knowledge and the skill that you have to put, you, you wouldn't have been able to do what you've done with white-tailed eagles, with bird kites, with ospreys, had it not been for that understanding of them as birds. And that brings me really to the second thing I wanted to raise, which is white-tailed eagles. We, we were talking in, in our virtual green room a moment ago about the fact that two of your uh, Isle of Wight birds are currently in Norfolk. Um, but your story with white-tailed eagles, I, I learned this from the book, it, go back, it goes back way back when you've been working on reintroducing white-tailed eagles to the British Isles for a, forgive me, but a very long time, Roy. Well, it was 1968 and um, I was the warden of Fair Isle Bird Observatory then in the Shetlands. And I had this incredible uh, boss, you know, uh, uh, George Waterston was just such a man, so, you know, charismatic and wanting to do things. And he, he phoned me up and said, I want to reintroduce four white-tailed eagles to Fair Isle next summer, and I want you to do it. You've got to look after them. You've got to release them. But before that, you need to talk to the crofters on Fair Isle and see what they think about it. And uh, for a young man, that was just a tremendous you know, opportunity and, and what fun. Now, looking back on it, releasing four eagles and hoping that you were going to get a breeding population uh, was really pie in the sky. But at least we worked out how to do it and we started it. And most of these things, there's a day that you've got to start. Uh, you've had enough talk, enough research. You've got to get in the field and get it done. And 68 on Fair Isle was special. And then we've been with sea eagles ever since. And I was driving north on Monday with my friends and there was one sitting, an adult sitting in a river uh, in Easter Ross looking for a fish. And I, you know, I would never have dreamt about that in the 60s. It is, it's magnificent and it's magnificent. Um, a, a legacy that you and all the people will get on to the fact that it's a very collaborative um, approach that you take, but um, it is a legacy of that work that we now today, just sitting at my desk, I've had kites fly past me. That comes from, as you say, that moment. Do you think that moment when George Waterson called you and said, or spoke to you and said, um, I want you to reintroduce white-tailed eagles, did that change your whole perspective as a conservationist? No, I don't think so. No. I think it was already there. It was an opportunity. Mm. And the, the thing I think about that, about the white-tailed eagle, and, uh, you know, also Osprey, is it's very sad to me that George died too young and he didn't see 
what we all manage to do. And I often think sometimes, I hope he does occasionally look down and notice that, you know, the other day, someone, the, Andy in, in um, Holcomb sent me a photograph with a white-tailed eagle being chased by two red kites in the same field of view. George would have thought that was incredible. Uh, uh, well, all of us, even in my childhood, we would have thought that was incredible. I'm very much hoping Andy's in the audience. He texted me um, five minutes before we came on saying, um, how do I get on to? And his boss, Jake, has just um, been asking questions. So we'll get on to that this evening. Good evening, Jake Fines, who manages the Holcomb National Nature Reserve with Andy's support. Now, on to ospreys, because of course, your enormous experience translocating ospreys comes originally from that that experience as a field naturalist. You were there right at the cutting edge of the Osprey recolonization of the United Kingdom. And happily we've, we've seen them march and be assisted um, to much, much greater things. But you've been involved with Ospreys your entire working life. Yeah, I, I was at the bottom of the Osprey tree today with someone uh, looking up and, <laughs> and um, thinking that in 1960, I first went there and I, I was, there was just one pair of Ospreys. And so the person was asking me about it. I think there were two things I noticed. One, how did I climb that tree to get a dud egg out of that nest when we had no gear at all? It was just free climbing. And I think sometimes, uh, yeah, that was probably risky. But the other was um, that it's become such an icon that that place, Loch Garton, and that again was to do with George Waterston. Uh, who was the first person that decided instead of keeping rare birds rare, we would open it up to the general public. And that first year, 15,000 people came. And that, that was a big change. Um, but from a personal point of view, it was the fact that in those years, just about every ornithologist in Britain made a journey to Loch Garton. So I met all these very senior people who then became, you know, friends or encouraged me in my work. And it was that in those years, those of us working full time in nature probably knew everybody in nature in Britain. We would meet them somewhere. And we would also know most of what they were working on. And now it's, impossible for me even to keep up with people working on raptors in Britain. You know, tremendous change. Which is in one way a very good thing that there are more boots on the ground doing things and there are more conservation organizations and there are more nature reserves. This is, this is a good thing, but it's harder for you to network. And in fact, that brings me- Yeah, but there's one, thing, there's one thing there should be. There should be less people in offices and more people out in the field. Yes, very much so. But both in terms of our own well-being and health um, and, and our position as a species, because we have this extraordinary blindness to the fact that we are another biological species in nature. Yeah. Um, but also because we need people out there doing stuff. Well, you are, you are a, quite an example of that. But, but that brings me, you've just been talking about the fact that back in the 60s, every single influential person in nature came through Loch Garten and you met them and you... One of the, another of the themes, in addition to your the, the value that you place on being a good naturalist, a good field ornithologist, um, you place a great deal of emphasis on teamwork. I don't know if that was a conscious thing writing the book, but you you honour dozens and dozens and dozens of people, and you constantly go back to mention the, the the effort of individual people so I'm thinking of Lorcan in Donegal when you're reintroducing golden eagles and you you specifically say um but I knew from past experience that the real work of eagle reintroduction was being carried out by Lorcan in Donegal the daily task of finding supplies of food for the eagles cutting it up delivering it to the cages and then for the rest of the year making certain that the carrion feeding sites for the free flying eagles were maintained with regular supplies of venison rabbits and roadkill and you um, a whole range of different people have passed through your midst, including um, prisoners in uh, Switzerland who conspired <laughs> to make you um, release pens for ospreys. But this begins with really what I think is your first 
intervention, which is putting up nest boxes in um, in Scotland for Goldeneye. And you, one of the things you say is how important, well, in your words, landowners, keepers, farmers, foresters, and people who lived alongside rivers or beside locks. You, you needed allies. And that's a theme that goes right the way through the book. It's not work you can do by yourself. No, and it, it's, it's always teamwork. Um, I'm really keen on small teams uh, of really, you know, people who are prepared to put in you know, 24 hour days just to get things done. Um, but I'm also recognized that, you know, unless you really get on with people in the countryside, farmers, crofters, foresters, keepers, the whole lot, it's very difficult to get some of these projects really underway because you, you, want, you want to do it tomorrow. So you, you don't want to have to negotiate. You, you should know the owner of that land or, you know, his manager. Um, well enough to say, look, we need to do this tomorrow. And they'll say yes. So there, there's, there's that requirement. But I think also it's that you build up that team and the team takes the pride in, you know, making it work. And I, I just find that, you know, you look back over the years, I, I was talking to Roger Broad recently, who, who was a, Warden at Fair Isle after me in the 1970s, and then came and worked with me for the RSPB in the Highlands afterwards. And we were, we were talking about old times then, and, and you still remember those times. They were, they were very special to us. And you talk a great deal about, one might say the generosity, not just generosity in terms of actually giving the birds, but um, the generosity of your colleagues in Scandinavia, in Eastern Europe, that um, it would have been impossible to have brought red kites back to the UK, to have brought the original white-tailed eagles, um, and some of your osprey projects as well, had it not been for an amazing network of really dynamic, positive, uh, collaborative people across Europe. Well, the red kite is a perfect example. You know, I'd been wanting to bring that back to Scotland for a very long time. And I was, I was really hitting the buffers all the time. I just, you know, because you, you know, this is a golden age of people, the, these recent years of rewilding, ecological restoration and the restoration of individual species. You know, there's never been a better time for it. But there were many decades when it was not flavor of the month. And red kite was one of those. And I, I happened to be bird watching in southern Sweden at Felstebo. And I was talking to a raptor friend there. And he said, oh, you must meet the guy who's doing his PhD on the red kite in southern Sweden. And um, he turned up, Magnus Sylvan. Uh, and Magnus was in a group of uh, birders. And we started talking. And he said to me, if you get permission, you can have young birds from my study area. And I said to him, but you're doing a PhD. They're more important for you. He said, no, what you're doing is more important than my doctorate. Wow. You get permission, we'll get them. Now, you can't have a better offer than that. And that's how, you know, and then someone asks us if we can get birds for somewhere else and, and start a project. So... I think it is a reciprocal one where the nations need to work together. And, uh, and generally speaking, it's really, really good. Well, certainly that comes across in your book again and again and again, because of course you talk about ospreys in Spain, ospreys in um, Switzerland, um, white-tailed eagles in various places. Um, it, you're working across the whole of Western Europe and both people providing young birds, but also people who work with you on the ground. You've, you've absolutely no shortage of them. Yeah, it's a, it's a magnificent network that you have. Well, I, I, I've always laughed because I, I would love to see white-tailed eagles on Gibraltar. And they used to be there. In fact, there are caves there where they've excavated Neanderthals and found that they decorated the bones of white-tailed eagles, you know, way, way back. And anyway, the guy in the wildlife organization there was quite keen. And then I heard nothing for a long time. And then I suddenly got a, an email from him. And he said, I'm now the minister of 
the environment and health for Gibraltar. And I'm really keen to do this project. And I wrote back and said, fantastic. I've got to get myself to be the Minister of the Environment in Scotland, and then we can have the links back. Uh, we still, he's still not managed to get the eagle back to Gibraltar, but it will come. It will, especially the more that you, the more that you relocate them in populated areas of lowland Europe, the more people will see that they're not this terrifying threat. And the more pe the people will see that they're not some animal, but we have this, I, I was talking to someone this week about this, the idea that white-tailed eagles are a, a, an animal of remote craggy landscapes. They're only a, an animal of remote craggy landscapes because we drove them there. and they, they would happily live in plenty of other places. However, slightly more controversially, you were talking about Andy taking a photograph at, um, at uh, Holcomb last week. Jake has a question, and I think because you were talking about relocations and reintroductions. Um, David, can we bring Jake in live to ask his question? Now you are colleagues and you know one another and you have lots in common. So um, let's see, uh, Jake, good evening, Jake. Nice to have you with us again. Um, ask your question away to Roy. Good evening, Roy, I hope you can hear me. Yes, I um, can hear you, Jake. Good to speak uh, to you. As, as ever, a pleasure to be in your company, although virtually. Um, Roy, we, I have seen more white-tailed eagles in two and a half years at Holcomb than I've seen in my entire career in trying to enhance the natural world. Um, many of these white-tailed eagles are some of, of your, uh, your creation through the uh, work you're doing on the Isle of Wight, but uh, equally many of them are white-tailed eagles from the continent where we're seeing uh, a significant ex um, uh, a significant escalation in the population there do we need you know for me naturalization of species is more wonderful than the reintroduction of species do we think that the norfolk coast could be uh, an exemplar of naturalization of uh, key species like the white-tailed eagle as opposed to reintroducing them? Well, the, the evidence is with some of these birds that the ones that are seen in Norfolk and Essex and Kent and so on are not necessarily uh, from the Netherlands in that new population. So that one of the birds that did have a ring on, which was in the New Forest, was actually quite far north in the Baltic in Sweden. So this, the ones that are furthest north are the most likely ones to come to Britain. And they will just not stay. Um, you know, when you look at the data, um, when we were looking at both osprey and white-tailed eagle in Europe, the average rate of extension of the population post-persecution is only 10 10K a year. Now, you could have a exceptional case but in general they are not going to breed unless you do something like this now you could say that i'm being impatient um but you know we've they died out 240 years in southern britain and we've waited a long time for them to come back and during many of those decades they were regularly visiting the south coast and the east coast um so I, I just don't think it's possible. There are other birds like the spoonbills on Holcomb uh, and great white egrets and a, a range of birds that were killed out by humans long ago, which are very good at colonizing new areas. You know, there's, there's nothing better at colonizing, recolonizing than the peregrine falcon. You know, that was killed, that died out in Southern England nearly due to pesticides in the 50s and 60s. And once those chemicals were gone, the peregrine just boomed. In fact, there are now more peregrines in England than there are in Scotland. And when I was young, it was a complete reverse. Even when I was young, it was unimaginable that um, I would see peregrines. I cycled down to Jake's Reserve um, at Holcomb the other day and saw two peregrines, you know, casually without 
um, without effort. They just, um, you know, the widgeon go up and you go up, there's a peregrine, you look up and there's a peregrine. Um, it is a, a wonderful success story. Well, thank you for that answer on white-tailed eagles. Now, in fact, that brings me to my next question that I had prepared, which is about telemetry, because in addition to moving birds, bo both, um, both birds which are nesting where they have naturally returned in the case of Scottish ospreys, but also birds that you've relocated um, to sites like Rutland, you have found out, you have contributed to, you and your team, of course, have contributed enormously to our understanding of what's going on through telemetry. That's, that's been a big chapter of your life, really. Yeah, we were very, we we're very fortunate that when we um, decided to take the ospreys to Rutland Water, the Anglia Water PLC owned Rutland Water. And uh, Stephen Bolt, the environmental guy there, was really keen on this project. And uh, we were getting a lot of, uh, you know, worries from people that by moving them four or 500 kilometers to the south, that they wouldn't go to the right place in Africa. Now, I did have the knowledge that they had been doing it in North America and it worked. But anyway, it meant that we were able to get the very first satellite transmitters to fit onto Ospreys in 1999. And I said, what we should do is put some on the ones we take to Rutland, some on their siblings that were left in Scotland, and if possible, on their parents. And that, that really started the work on satellite tracking of raptors and seeing how well, they uh, traversed the Sahara and went down into West Africa and the ones that were released did, did the same thing. I always thought that the Sahara was a major hazard for ospreys. But once we got the really refined satellite transmitters that told us where the bird was every minute, we could see that they just thermaled up to seven or eight thousand feet and then just glided for 40 30 miles and then did the same and going over the desert it meant they didn't get up very early they tended to get up about 10 o'clock when the thermals started to heat and then the journey was in fact really pretty relaxed now we wouldn't have known that without these uh, special transmitters and with the white-tailed eagles now those are tracked, can be tracked every minute of the day. And now we, we did that because we wanted to know where they were, uh, but we also did it as a safety that if a farmer was worried about sheep or deer, or, you know, or anything, we would know where the birds were and which birds. And, and that is invaluable. I think, I think what it demonstrates to country people is that you are doing your best uh, to be aware of the situation, both from the bird's point, your point, and their point. And it also provides a, a storyline that shows that they're not, they're not stealing people's children, they're not um, eating people's dogs, they're not. And we had one here in Norfolk all through last autumn, one who, uh, who was not seen for weeks on end unless people knew where she was and she lived very peaceably by herself with nobody knowing and you had one the first year you had one in oxfordshire didn't you that that yes. went to ground and nobody you know was nearby a road and people just didn't know the bird was there well these birds these young these young sea eagles um just sit in a tree for over 90 percent of their day so they're not flying around they just you know they just sit and watch um, but what I, what I really um, am amazed by, but then looking back, I'm not that amazed, is during lockdown, what tremendous joy someone sitting in their gardens in a town and looked up and saw one of these birds go over. And so our email box is full of people saying, you know, I never, ever thought. I'd see this in my lifetime. And it was over my house. You know, that, that, that's, that's tremendous.
It really is. I had one go over. The first one, I think it was G393 that came to Norfolk in April last year, went right over where I'm sitting now. Mm -hmm. I was sitting in the back garden and I saw it go over with a buzzard up its tail. And it was just a split second. But it was one of those, that's absolutely astonishing. One's mm -hmm. gone. So I am, I'm a witness of, it, of exactly that. Are you doing telemetry now? Also, this isn't in the book because the book is about rewilding restoration and and relocations but um are you also satellite tagging uh honey buzzards yes we have done them and um we we um we've had them go right down to gabon um and nigeria and sierra leone uh, and they make very good journeys uh, we put one of the new type of transmitters on a young honey buzzard last autumn and tracked it right across the desert and then it flew down into Cameroon or somewhere down there, and we've heard nothing about it. Now, the problem is that the latest radios rely on the mobile phone system. And it could be just in an area with no mo mobile phone rec reception. And the Swedes, are then, the Finns have had a similar issue with some of their ospreys. And they hear nothing from about mid-October, late October, and then suddenly in April, these birds come back into range as they travel north and they get all the data back then. So, so yeah, it's, a, it's a, compared to when we were young and we put a ring on a bird and generally we heard about one in a hundred. It's dramatically different. It is extraordinary. I have a friend, a close friend at uh, Wildfowl well and Wetlands Trust who um, has a number of um, tagged pink-footed geese as part of their long-term projects. And um, the birds will breed in Iceland, but then they'll go up to the northeast of Greenland to molt. And they disappear from because there are no mobile networks in northeast Greenland. And then they come back through Iceland and they get this massive information about what they've been up to for the last three weeks a month. Um, so just that very same situation. So well, yeah. I hope your honey buzzard um, will reappear, will pop up at some point. Now, one thing that's very, um, very powerful in the book, and there are times obviously when you, you feel real frustration or disappointment, um, is what I've referred to as the narrative arc of a project. Um, the, a project takes a huge amount of determination, a huge amount of optimism sometimes um, when there really isn't <laughs> a lot to be optimistic about, but, but a certain amount of this is what we're going to do. And you, um, just to quote you a few things you say in the introduction, you say, as always, I urge young people in school, in work at university or freshly graduated to take note that wildlife recovery projects are very long term and need determination and perseverance. And then there's an interesting thing that you say in the same context later on, once a project gets started, there is a shift and opposition lessens. And finally, when it is successful, the early naysayers claim ownership, but that matters little to you if your principal aim is to restore nature. But it's, these projects are, they are the work of a lifetime, aren't they? They are, and um, you know, you, 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 you just start with, it's always when, never if, you know, you know this project will go ahead. It may not go ahead in your lifetime, but it will go ahead sometime. And uh, I always remember, I think I wrote it in the book, that I was up in uh, the Yukon with two um, Germans who were experts on, on brown bear and wolf and, and lynx. And we went into the wildlife um, office in Whitehorse and Christoph said to the guy, um, Roy's dream is to have wolves back in Scotland. And he said to me, oh, he said, do you work on anything else? And I said, yeah, I do work on ospreys and golden eagles and so on. He said, that's very important because if you only work on one species, someone, probably a, a, a senior colleague or your boss or someone will stop you in your tracks. And then you have to wait for that person to be promoted, retire or die. And then you shoot forward. So if you've got different projects going at different speeds, you've always got something to do. And I thought that was really good advice. And I would give that as really good advice. Yeah.
And it, um, in part explains, obviously, you've been sought as you've successfully been in, uh, involved leading the um, relocation of Ospreys to Rutland and then subsequently to Poole Harbour and White-tailed Eagles now to the Isle of Wight, having populated Scotland with White-tailed Eagles and further afield, you've, you've gained notoriety and you've been contacted by colleagues all over Southern Europe, particularly for Ospreys. Yeah, we... You know, uh, lovely. Yesterday, I got a um, quick WhatsApp from ITOR in uh, the Basque Country saying that an osprey that we had moved to Scotland, moved from Scotland, uh, was back on its breeding nest yesterday. And, uh, you know, you remain kind of in contact with those people and you enjoy their successes because they did the work and you're just wanting them to have yeah, populations rising, and, and that's great fun. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that white-tailed eagle reintroduction will start in Spain probably next year. And that will be a tremendous change. And uh, when we've been down there in the Cota Daniana with the guys that will do it, and, and you see a small flock of flamingos, and one of them is limping with a broken wing, and you think, you know, that is food for a white-tailed eagle. Um, rather gloriously coloured food, I must say. <laughs> Very stylish food indeed. Um, at this point, I'm going to bring in David. Can we bring in Sarah Hansen, who has a question? And anyone else who's watching, do feel free to pop your questions for Roy in the question and answer. Um, and he will, if we have time, of course, be delighted to answer them. We haven't got that many coming in yet. Sarah. Uh, your mic just needs to go on. There we are. We should be able to hear you, Sarah. Hi, Roy. Hi. In terms of uh, rewilding of uplands, um, uh, could you talk a little bit about how what your approach would be? I'm thinking in particular sort of around some of the issues around driven grouse shooting. I mean, do you have a sort of take on what how you'd like to see the uplands progressing into a, a more kind of healthy um, ecosystem. Yeah, I was very involved in all of that when I was, a, you know, the regional officer for the RSPB and, uh, you know, losing far too many golden eagles and peregrine falcons and, you know, you'd go to a nest and it would be shot out and so on. Um, my take on all of that nowadays uh, you know, there's a lot of good people working on trying to stop that. My attitude now is much more that I don't see that we can keep huge areas of moorland for the future. It's more important for our young people and the future of the earth that we reforest these areas. So when people say you live in a beautiful part of the world, I look at it as a degraded landscape a landscape which has lost nearly all of its tree cover. And our rivers now run, our rivers are now starting to run too hot. The water will be too hot for salmon in the future, unless we can get trees covering the headwaters of these rivers. So I kind of go past that now. I think it's, you know, even if people stop killing raptors on grouse moors, I'm not sure that for the ecology of the earth, we can maintain these massive areas without woodland. I have, have often reflected to myself that we've got our grouse upside down, that in a completely natural upland landscape, now obviously we're many thousands of years post a natural landscape, but the red grouse would be a scarce bird because it would be a bird of those few areas where some stochastic event had happened, um, a fire had happened or that was an area that bores had dug over or whatever and you had an area of open ground but of course we would have had vast areas of Caledonian pine forest which is Capricale habitat would have had huge areas of birch scrub which is black grouse habitat we've got we've got our grouse completely the wrong way up in terms of which ones should be common. I think one of the most important things for conservation people is to know their history very well and uh, when I went to Scotland there were relatively few bird books. 
you know, I don't say it now, but there are too many books nowadays. Um, but the the books that I went to were the the books of the Victorian age of, uh, you know, the fauna of Russia, the fauna of Invernessia. And you would find all about how the sea eagles had been killed out or how the wolf had been exterminated and all sorts of things. And nowadays it's a shifting, shifting baselines. So you see new papers come out and people compare the situation now with 2001 or 1990. Or some of us are old enough to compare it with 1960 and then it looks grim. But the other important thing, and I was talking to, I found a friend the other day. He's one of my really good scientific friends who, who really does kind of think more than many of them. And I said, how long has the woodcock been in existence? Am I correct in thinking the woodcock's been here? for two to five million years. So it used to feed on the insects in the dung of woolly rhinoceros and mammoth. And he said, obviously, Roy, you know, that's how we should think of the woodcock, but it, it's been there so long. And we kind of remove all cattle out of woods. Uh, you know, we dose them with insecticides. You know, no wonder some of these birds are in trouble. But I think you do need to think about the history of wildlife as well. How landscape came to be as it is. In fact, I lived in Central South America for a long time um, around hyacinth macaws and hyacinth macaws habitually follow cattle and they eat the, um, they crack open the palm nuts that have been digested by the cattle. So the cattle have eaten the soft sweet flesh from the outside and the hyacinth macaws crack the nuts and um, eat the, the, the fatty flesh in the center. And it's highly likely that they evolved in the presence of a megafauna that was extinguished when humanity reached South America. And they're just following the cattle because they are, oh, wow, we've got a megafauna back again. Uh, they're behaving in a way they would ancestrally have done. Now, talking of ancestral wildlife, Roy, you say of beavers, this has been the most difficult chapter to write. The reintroduction of the beaver has been a never ending saga with very strong opinions on both sides. In fact, it's been a bit like beaver country. The way ahead for beaver ecology looks clear, then suddenly there's a log jam caused by farmers or politicians. The ideas run around uh, the edge and create a new way through, but then there's another block as one or other side of the argument triumphs and holds the whole thing up. Tell us about beavers and where you stand with them. Obviously in Derek Dow, there is now a, you have an enormously passionate and committed and at times, dare I say, bloody minded um, tri triumph, a uh, champion of beavers and beavers are looking up greatly. So um, how do you feel about beavers? Well, you know, not many birds and animals are major kind of, you know, species within the landscape. You know, the beaver is probably one of the greatest ecosystem engineers. And the evidence in mainland Europe, you know, when we started to really talk about this way back in the 60s, was absolutely clear that for waterways not to have beavers was a serious problem. And yet we've never been able to get the animal back in a really um, proper way. You know, we've got a small population in Scotland, which is away in the Western Argyle, and will never be successful. It's in an area, it was chosen so that they couldn't get out of that area by the government. And it didn't really answer the questions about their impact on salmon rivers or agriculture. And then some escaped in Perthshire. Now, as soon as they're in better quality landscape, they zoomed ahead. And then everything that was talked about, about them holding water back, slowing down flooding, um, holding, uh, you know, soil, um, creating fantastic water uh, systems for every other creature you could imagine, showed that the beaver is really essential for every river in Britain. But there's been this opposition to them which has been incredibly strong you know people in the government body saying yeah you can have some in as long as they're sterile 
and they don't breed. And you think, what? No, the, the discussions are being, and in Scotland, we have, uh, you know, this system where they are protected and yet large numbers are being shot by farmers. Now, what we're going to have to do for the future and why I think all that we do is really to the benefit of young people. Really, the, it's the young people are going to have to live in this world, you know, 60, 80 years ahead. My, my 12 year old daughter. So I, I feel very strongly that we've got to do these things. And um, no farm should be planting intensive agriculture within a meter of a river. So we have these rivers in Eastern Scotland full of carrot fields and potato fields. And the beavers just walk over the bank and they're in the crop. So every river should really have about 20 meters at least of woodland cover to prevent agricultural runoff, to maintain the rivers and all the requirements of life. You know, far too many agricultural chemicals run off into rivers, into the estuaries and into the sea, causing huge damage. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised that a requirement that every river is treated properly with a woody bank and the presence of beavers will become standard in England and Scotland within 10 or 20 years. That's certainly something to be hoped for because as you say, the state of the, the, the balance of our landscape is, is stacked away from the forces that um, preserve wildlife and create habitat for wildlife, sadly, very much so. Now I'm going to ask a couple of quick questions that have come in from people. Um, the first one, is from Stephen Green, who asks, what you think of continued feeding of red kites in Wales, where you can see huge numbers? Do you know what? I'm a person that's not very keen on feeding. Uh, you know, I don't like the idea of all these peanuts. Um, <laughs> I've never been very happy about the bird organizations selling peanuts, because there must be somewhere in the world that all this growing of peanuts is not good for the natural environment. So I'm not in favor of that. But I am in favor <laughs> of feeding kites because the kite and the white-tailed eagle and these were following man at kills of woolly mammoth, uh, woolly rhinoceros. Um, they were following, you know, the, the, the story in the wild is that ravens get most of their food from wolf kills. And that a, a deer killed by a pack of wolves will provide more food for the other species than it will for the wolf pack. So you could say that in Britain now, um, food is very scarce for carrion eaters, not just for birds and animals, but even for burying beetles and bone fungus and all of that sort of thing. So, so I'm very, I'm in favor of that. And I think it's essential because as a nation, we clean up the countryside. Every dead animal is removed. Where, what, where, where is the sense of removing washed up whales if they're not causing a problem to a town or a village? You know, when I was a kid, and first came to the north of Scotland, I could go out on the shore and find wolf uh, whale bones. But now when a whale turns up, oh, there's a mad rush that the local council have got to drag it off to a, a dump. So there is a problem that there is not enough naturally remaining dead animals in the countryside. I think as a nation, we are rather frightened of natural process. We are, um, because we live on an island and we've lived on an island for a very long time, we are much, much more intolerant of other species that at large charismatic species that, that live in the same landscape. We are, when, when you think about relationships with wolves, with lynx, with bears, with eagles, on the continent, not very far away from the UK, our paranoia about, and beavers also, our paranoia about them is something quite extraordinary, I think. 
Yeah, but then I would say that conservationists have not been very good at putting that over. You know, in Scotland, the tradition is that when you shoot red deer on the hill, you gut it on the hill and you leave what's called the gralic or the innards on the ground. And, and that's a major food for golden eagle and raven and, and fox and so on. Uh, and at one stage, the government from Edinburgh came to a meeting when I was on the Red Deer Commission and said, you know, that's dirty. Um, we can't allow that to continue. And hunters will need to put that into a bag and bring it down to be properly disposed of. I said to this politician, this uh, civil servant, I said, how do you mean dirty? Oh, well, it's just dirty. Someone might catch something off it. So you say, well, what are they going to catch off it? This has happened in nature for millions of years. And it is this kind of trying to sanitize the countryside. And that's very worrying. And take away diversity, because even on a microscopic level, the presence of the calcium in the bones of a decomposing corpse, the phosphates and so on from its decomposing flesh, um, th that creates micro diversity, which is what drives diversity, even if it's tiny, minute little flies that we don't know anything about, they need that edge, they need that change in the landscape. And if you tidy it all up and make it the same, that's not going to exist. Yeah, I suppose people say I poke my nose in, but I must say when the bearded vulture was in the Peak District National Park, I was quite horrified that there was not a vulture restaurant there. Mm. You know that, you know that every animal is being removed. So, you know, and uh, all the bones are being removed. And I, I thought, you know, if one day there will be bearded vultures breeding again in Britain. I can so see your name on that one. I can see your name. You're already drawing up the plans. I can no, see. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> now we have a very um, related but very straightforward, simple question from Christine Campbell. Where are the white-tailed eagles on the Isle of Wight? Um, she is in Hampshire. Where are they? Yes. Where can she see them, I suppose she means that she's in yeah. Hampshire. <clears throat> You know, one of the most important things with this project is that we don't create um, we don't create problems for farmers and landowners and nature reserves and that by saying, you know, one of the birds has landed here. And that's why um, my colleague Tim doesn't put up to date maps on our website, because if a bird may land and some of them have stayed for several months on a farm or a group of farms and they're just not ready to have large numbers of bird photographers or bird people so i think the real difference will be is when some of them start breeding and they may breed in a nature reserve and then there undoubtedly there will be a public observation point but on the isle of wight now um, the chances are, if you drove around and look in several places, you will see them. You know, people are seeing them more and more. And this winter, there's a viewpoint on the very south coast of the Isle of Wight at a place called Black Gang. And you can look out at the channel. And a couple of the sea eagles were going up to four kilometers offshore and hunting fish with the gull flocks and lots of people saw them from there. And then you're doing no harm at all. You're watching a bird going out to sea and hunting. And, um, you know, as a young bird watcher, I used to go to St. Catherine's Point on the Isle of Wight to study bird migration. Cracky, I never thought then that one day you could sit there and look out to sea and you'd see white-tailed eagles hunting in the, in the English Channel. Magnificent. Magnificent, and we're thrilled to have some with us in Norfolk at the moment. Um, a slightly more contentious question from me, Roy. Um, do you think, I sometimes worry there's a false dichotomy or perhaps a, a, a demoralizing narrative that comes from, now, now uh, this is not in any way taking away from what you're doing. It's, there are voices who, who constantly tell conservation conservationists, conservation organizations, you failed, you failed, you failed. There's this, 
and, it, and it's a very seductive narrative that gets put, picked up in the press, it gets picked up in, in the media. Now, in fact, if one, if one looks around, obviously the landscape itself is on its knees. Um, our farms, our roads, our towns are, are desperately nature depleted. But, but it, the way I see it, traditional nature conservation organizations have been throwing everything they've got for, for, for 150 years in many cases, and, and actually recreating lowland heaths, recreating wet grassland, recreating um, lost wetlands in the case of Lake and Heath here in um, East Anglia. I, I sometimes worry that there's a, a false dichotomy because I think we're all allies and colleagues in the same thing, and that we need to get rid of this narrative that conservation has failed, but that we as a nation have have gone down the wrong path in terms of our landscape management. I I think we have failed. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, th I think there were golden years in the, 40, the 50s and 60s and 70s with Peter Scott and James Fisher and the establishment of the Nature Conservancy and the beginning of the RSPB and the nat you know, natural tr uh, Nature Trust in various places. And I think they did extremely well. And when I think of the seriousness of, uh, you know, the um, agricultural chemicals that were killing um, eagles and preventing peregrines, you know, dealdrins and that, and sheep dips. And that was stopped by the Nature Conservancy and the, the conservation bodies. And then later on, I would say that they, I think now, considering their membership, they don't have much clout with government, real clout. You know, I, I, I'm sure in the days that I remember some of the early, um, you know, chairman of the Nature Conservancy and the uh, chief executive of the RSPB, uh, they could call up very senior people or the prime ministers and say, look, this needs sorting out. Uh, I don't see that now. And I think there are too many people in, especially in government organizations, you know, nowadays, the, the chairman are not chosen. They go through the quango system. So they, you know, they, they have to kind of apply for the jobs. And my view is that in say 40 years ago, the chairman of the Nature Conservancy would tell the minister what he needs to know. And nowadays, too many of those people tell the minister what he wants to know. And that's a big difference. And, you know, fortunately, more and more people are standing up and saying these changes require to change. So I do think, yeah, I think that's why the young people are having an impact, because I think they've just said, look, we're fed up, you haven't done enough. But the big change in my lifetime is a fantastic change by people owning large areas of land, suddenly saying, we want to do something different. You know, people like Jake and his, his boss and all that, just saying, you know, and, and they're, they're creating nature on much larger scales than on traditional nature reserves. So you could look at the nature reserves. I always used to talk to Tim Appleton at Rutland, and I think Rutland is a superb reserve. But my view was, you should take the kilometer surrounding it out of agriculture, put it into flower meadows. And, you know, we're, we've got a serious problem of not having enough flowers for pollinating insects. So, yeah, we can't rest on our laurels at all. And I think at the present time, you could say that private people are doing more than the bodies. Thank you. Thank you. So you've mentioned Jake uh, just there. Um, Jake has a second question. He says he's of the firm belief that the Roy Dennis legacy will go on and on. What would you like to be on your epitaph? <laughs> no, I don't think so. But I, you know, we must get, I used to say, we'll have the links back before I die. God, there's some, some real requirement 
for me to keep living. But yeah, there's lots we still need to do. There's a vast amount. There's a vast amount. And we need, you touch on private landowners, we need more and more because the the problem is the way we manage landscape, and that's a whole range of different industries. The problem is, is, is our agriculture, the problem is our shooting industry, the problem is all manner of things. We, the way we ourselves create roads and we drive and we create railways and we do all manner of things. It's not any individual, but we, we need more and more and more enlightened people like the Holcomb Estate, like the Nepp Estate, to, to be saying, enough of this. We, we are all changing. We also, you know, this hopefully the pandemic has given people an opportunity to rethink their own futures you know it's very tremendously sad that people have lost relatives and that um but rethinking our own priorities do we always need to travel so much you know if this had been done um in normal times i'd be on easy jet going around the country or catching the plane down to norfolk um it was that always was that always sensible um going to meetings at headquarters why um working from home that's really beneficial you know that will go on into the future you may go into the office one or two times a week but fantastic you're not using the car you're not burning all that fuel you're not wasting all that time you're seeing your family more. So there, there are, and you hope that after this, people will say, we've got to just be better living on this earth. Those are, that's a fine place to, to bring our conversation towards its end. But before we do bring the conversation towards its end, I'm sure everybody who's um, taking part this evening will have been inspired by um, Roy and by his passion and by all that he's achieved and many people alongside him have achieved. If you're interested to purchase his book, you can do so from our friends Wild Sounds of Books. Hold up a copy again, Roy. It even has a very beautiful cover with a white-tailed eagle. He's one of his emblematic species. You can purchase it through the link that is in the uh, chat attached to this conversation, but also you'll be able to get that through the emails that you've received uh, in relation to this conversation. Likewise, should you be a closet millionaire and wish to help us rewild a large area of land around our Thompson Common Reserve, then please also follow the link and you can help us at Norfolk Wildlife Trust restore lost grassland and lost pingos, which are ancient periglacial wetlands and of extremely high importance for red data species. But um, by way of thanks to Roy, um, I want to read um, a few words from, which really sort of encapsulate your mission to me. You say, for me, nature conservation is about more than the protection of individual species or habitats. It is to do with life on earth. It is the optimum use of the sun's energy to create plant biomass, which in turn is eaten and digested by herbivores and thus by carnivores. It is a a functional world to which you aspire. Very much, very much. And then you say, there's always another time and a place. And of course, it's salutary to remember that you have to have optimism to maintain <laughs> your vision. Yeah, in very pessimistic times, you, you know, the human race is just brilliant at optimism. And it's amazing what we can solve. You know, if we really try, you know, who could believe, you know, that we're thinking that we'll phase out petrol and diesel engines, but it's perfectly possible. It's just a determination to do so. So it is, you know, it's, it's tricky times. You know, I grew up in a, I, I was one of the fortunate ones. I was born in the second world war and I wasn't killed fortunately. Um, and then I grew up in a time when you could easily get a job, you know, life was pretty easy, you could go on holidays and all sorts of things. So I was fortunate from that point of view, but there's fantastic things to do now. Isn't that amazing? Real challenges, so get out there and do it. If anyone is interested in the work that Roy does, I invite you to visit his website, which is the Roy Dennis Wildlife Foundation. It's roydennis.org, isn't it, the website? 
That's correct. RoyDennis.org. And you can find out about all these projects. You can see recent maps of the whereabouts of the white-tailed eagles. As he says, you can't see them in real time so as to keep the pressure off them. Um, thank you to everybody who's taken part this evening. Um, please do join us the next time that we speak. We um, will be talking to Sam Lee, who is a folk singer, and he has been for years gathering stories about our cultural relationship with nightingales and has written a beautiful book and is passionate about the protection of the nightingale and its continued existence, not just as a species, but as also as part of our dreamscape as a nation. And we'll be talking to him early in April and you can find out details of that on our website, clycalling.com. Don't forget to buy your copy of Roy's inspiring book, every bit as inspiring as the great man himself. One final plea from me, this is a personal one. If you're about to be released from semi lock down and you're coming up from the coast. Remember please that, um, and I'm sure everyone in the audience this evening will do this, but remember that during the time that we've been confined, many species will have moved into areas they don't necessarily occupy. And although we're gasping for air and desperate to be released back into the countryside, it's really, really important that we, our dogs, our horses, whatever way we're visiting, beaches, nature reserves, outside areas, that we respect the other species that live alongside us because they have been enjoying our being locked down. Thank you very much indeed for joining us once again, Roy Dennis. I'm greatly looking forward to the next book. You need to write one so we can have you back next year. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thanks to everyone who's attended. Bye -bye. And a very good night to you all.